Today I'm going to talk about the gracilis free muscle and myocutaneous flap. This flap can be used as a muscular or myocutaneous flap for soft tissue reconstruction, also as a functional muscle transfer. Gracilis is the most superficial of the adductor thigh muscles. It is a thin and flat muscle, going from the pubis in the upper part to the medial surface of the proximal tibia, just distal to the tibial tuberosity. In the upper part, it is between the adductor magnus and the adductor longus. There are several papers describing the variability of the vascularity of the gracilis flap, especially how unreliable is its skin powder. Juridi describes that the main pedicle is the artery to the adductors in most of the cases, few times the medial circumflex femoral artery, and sometimes it has double supply in the upper part. For me, it is a very reliable flap. I always find this pedicle entering 6 to 8 centimeters from the pubis and 1.5 or uh, 2 centimeters from the entrance of the obturator nerve into the gracilis. Um, it is really important to include in the gracilis when we are raising this as a, a myocutaneous flap the septum between the adductor longus and the gracilis. This septum because here there are the most of the perforators. In this picture we can see also the secondary branches, uh, the secondary pedicles of the gracilis. Here and here, the main pedicle right here. Mobilization of the adductor longus allows tracing of the pedicle to its origin, to the profunda femoral artery. It is really important to include this uh, intermuscular septum and the fascia over the adductor longus into the, the flap when we are raising this uh, myocutaneous flap. The flap was described initially as a pedicle flap. In 1972, Orticochea at the Javeriana University in Colombia described the gracilis myocutaneous flap, avoiding the need of the delay procedure used at that time. The concept of including the muscle in the flaps was the beginning of a new field in plastic surgery, the area of muscle and myocutaneous flap. Same year, Orticochea published his technique for penis reconstruction using the innervated myocutaneous gracilis flap. Here we can see the outcomes, urinating, erected, and an electron myogram. He described four pedicles for the gracilis. The first from the medial circumflex femoral artery, the second a perforator from the profunda femoris artery, and the other two distal branches coming directly from the femoral artery. Macro presented his experience with the gracilis myocutaneous flap for vaginal reconstruction. Because he had several uh, distal skin necrosis in several patients, he recommended to avoid the distal part of the skin over the saltarius muscle. He described the advantages of this flap for perineal reconstruction. A big amount of innervated skin, a convenient rotation point for the area, an expendable and not bulky muscle, and an aesthetic donor deformity. As a myocutaneous free flap was described initially by Harry in 1976, he described the use of this flap as a functional myocutaneous free flap, with complete survival of the muscle but distant necrosis of the skin island. Same year, Harry presented two cases of free transfer of the gracilis muscle for dynamic reconstruction of the facial paralysis, using the temporalis nerve to reinnervate the muscle. In 1978, Mattis described the gracilis myocutaneous free flap and how the distal part of the skin was not reliable, as was noted by Harry. Giordano concludes that the most reliable skin is in the proximal third of the gracilis. He recommended a delay procedure if we want to include the distal part of the skin. Joseph described how the cutaneous perforators from the proximal pedicle of the gracilis were running primarily horizontal, so the transverse upper gracilis skin island is more reliable. Also, he described how this transverse upper gracilis flap can be used 
for tongue reconstruction. Vexelberger describes how the dissection must proceed in the subfacial plane and how the intermuscular septum between the adductor magnus and the gracilis must be included in the flap. A few days ago we had to deal with a complication of a fibula free flap. We lost the skin island, so we decided to uh, cover this wound with a transverse upper gracilis flap with a small vertical component here. And here we have the skin, the muscle, and the pedicle. Here the adductor longus muscle, the rhizophanous vein here. And we use the muscle to cover the plate and to give more, give more bulk to that place to avoid the extrusion, the extrusion of the plate. And here at the end, when we inserted the skin. Let's see what we did in a video. Here we have the medial aspect of the thigh. The upper edge of the flap is marked two centimeters below this crease, just to make sure that we include the perforators here in this part. Uh, we identified the adductor longus tendon, and two centimeters behind that, we will find the gracilis aligned from this point to the uh, medial upper uh, tibia uh, is draw and that will be the axis of the flap, the axis of the gracilis. We take the skin in the upper part, in the upper third, just making sure that we will be able to close it with a pinch test. And here we have the adductor, uh, the tendon here, the obturator, the gracilis muscle, the femoral artery, the medial circumflex femoral artery there, passing below the adductor, entering in the medial part of the gracilis, and here we have the perforators to the skin uh, in this part and how the obturator nerve is 1.5 centimeters above the entrance of the, of the uh, vascular pedicle. Here we have the proximal part of the gracilis, the distal part of the gracilis, we fold this in this direction. Here we have the skin and how the pedicle goes below the adductor, how we surround the adductor and retract the grid of venous vein. We have to remember that the small perforators are in an area of 6 by 6 centimeters at the entrance of the main pedicle into the proximal gracilis muscle. This flap has been described for breast reconstruction approximating two wings to create breast projection. In this clinical case, Arnest presented how the ideal patient for this flap is someone with a small or medium-sized breast also how the resulting scar can be moved to a better position in a second stage. Bontek presented their experience using the same method to give proje projection to the, to the reconstructed breast, folding the wings as Arnes proposed. Park proposed the vertical flap to avoid the potential problems of the transverse upper gracilis flap, like scar migration, or labial spreading. Vexelberger presented their experience and markings. The optimal patient for this technique is a patient with a small to medium sized breast, sufficient skin laxity, and excessive fat tissue at the inner and posterior side. I haven't found a patient who prefer a free chiroplasty instead of a free abdominoplasty. It is an easy and fast procedure with a nice position of the scar. It can be harvested in a supine position. There is no risk of abdominal hernias and no need of any preoperative imaging. But it's a small flap for a small breast. And in our country, small breasts are reconstructed mainly with implants. Locke presented their bad experience with this flap for breast reconstruction. They need to reoperate most of their patients in order to provide more volume. Both of them performing major procedures, like the one presented here, where they needed to do two additional deep flaps to improve the outcome. 
They hardly got a sufficient tissue to create even small breasts, as we see in these two clinical cases presented by them. A free gracilis muscle flap is my ideal flap for lower leg reconstruction of small or kind of small defects close to the anterior or posterior tibial arteries. I prefer terminolateral anastomosis if it's possible. Muscle is my best option for complex contaminated or even infected wounds. Muscle is better than skin because fills better the dead space and provides better nutrition to the underlying tissues than the fat of the skin flaps. Like in this patient with severe trauma close to the, anterior, the posterior tibial artery. In patients with no severe trauma, it is almost a 100% success rate with quite cosmetic outcome in the recipient or the donor sites. At the beginning, the flap could be bulky, but as time passes, muscle is atrophied. I like this flap for small defects. It's easy, fast, reliable, not bulky at the end, and there is no need of any supramicrosurgery. Finally, my favorite part, functional muscle transfer. Brazilis is the ideal muscle for functional muscle transfer because it is a completely expendable muscle with a dominant pedicle and a single motor nerve. It can be used as a complete muscle and tendon in the treatment of brachial plexus paralysis or as a partial unit for facial reanimation. As a, functional, as a functional muscle transfer is used to restore movement in the upper extremity. I don't perform this surgery. This is a clinical case from my partner and friend Dr. Luis Eduardo Nieto. He used the flap to restore elbow flexion in patients with brachial plexus injury, like in this clinical case. I learned how to use the muscle for facial reanimation from Dr. Tercis in 1996 and later from Dr. Zucker, several details to get good outcomes with the partial gracilis functional transfer in Mobius patients. In my craziness to do new things, I have tried several other muscles like rectus abdominis or latissimus dorsi with terrible outcomes. The best outcomes we can get is with gracilis. Free muscle transplantation is the treatment of choice for long-standing paralysis. If there is a unilateral paralysis, the ideal nerve to neurotize the transplanted muscle is a cross-facial nerve graft in order to achieve a more natural, symmetrical, involuntary movement. In bilateral cases, nerve, the nerve used to neurotize the muscle is the masseter nerve, obtaining good excursion of the muscle. Because it's good neurotization, the muscle doesn't atrophy as much as uh, with the cross-facial nerve graft and bulkiness become a problem. The, re the key of this surgery is to try to obtain good commissure excursion, control the bulkiness, ensure the insertion of the flap in the right place in the oral commissure. It is impossible to cover all the details of this surgery here, but it is important to mention some key points. Transfer a portion of the muscle, just a portion of the muscle. Adjust the tension of the transplanted muscle. Excise soft tissue in the recipient site, including the buccal fat pad. The use of mechanical suture in the stamps will help in the fixation of this muscle to the ural cumisure. In the long standing paralysis, we perform first, and in the unilateral cases, we perform first the cross facial nerve graft. Then, after nine months, we do the free gracilis muscle transplant, and that is the outcome that we can achieve. In this patient, we also uh, did a uh, go wave for the upper eyelid and the movement is quite symmetrical, quite involuntary. That is the most important part, it's involuntary. And uh, some other examples with the uh, muscle transplant for facial paralysis. Uh, I don't like really the bulkiness of this part or this part. And some other outcome of those patients. I like really this outcome. It's quite natural, the, the outcome. I would love to have more excursion of this uh, uh, muscle and I would love to improve the insertion of the muscle here or the insertion of the muscle here.
Es un honor para mí haber sido invitado a participar en este evento. Gracias a todos ustedes.